This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Hello everyone, this is Calimar here. And no, it's not Calamari. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. It has been a long time since I last did a miraculous redesign video, so I think it's about time I pick it up again and provide the long-awaited continuation to my miraculous rewrites main storyline. We are picking things up with the redesign and integration of a highly requested character, Natalie Sankur, assistant and criminal accomplice to Gabriel Agrest. Being one of the only people in the show to know Gabriel's secret identity, I've had a lot of people asking me what role she had to play in my rewrite, and her presence is certainly difficult to ignore given the important role she plays in the show. After all, not only is she Adrian's caretaker, tutor, and bodyguard, she's also responsible for managing the Agrest mansion and Gabriel's fashion label. I genuinely hope that at the very least she gets paid well for all the work she's doing because Gabe really should have hired more staff instead of dumping it all on one person. But even then, I don't know if any amount of money is even worth all the stress and responsibility she undoubtedly has to shoulder. Like, I get rich people can literally pay other people to do their jobs for them, including being a parent to their own children, but at the very least, hire more than one person to do your job, you know? I don't know about you, but it's giving Amber Heard and Kate James vibes. Or maybe Pepper Potts and Tony Stark might be more apt? Because the reason that Natalie always sticks by Gabriel's side and puts herself through all the things she does is due to her deep, unrequited love for Gabriel. Yes, there's actual good romantic drama in Miraculous, and it's not between Marinette and Adrian, or Adrian and Kagami, or Luca and Marinette. It's between Gabriel, Natalie, and Emily. And if you disagree with me, you can argue with the wall. He's desperately in love with his comatose wife and is risking everything he has to bring her back to his life. His fortune, his reputation, his dignity, and even his own son. But he's so transfixed on bringing back the past that he can't see the future he could have had. A future with Natalie, the woman who has been by his side through thick and thin, willingly putting her life and safety on the line to protect him and support him with the peacock miraculous, and loves him warts and all. It's absolutely delightful, but at the same time, I also think that Natalie deserves way better than Gabriel and I hope she realizes this and they don't end up together. But that being said, I actually like that dynamic, especially in a show that is meant to focus on some parts about romance. And I just think it's a lot more age appropriate as well because you can go into deeper topics, more serious stakes than just, oh, my crush has a crush on another girl. I'll never survive this tragedy. So in regards to Natalie's relationships, especially with Gabriel and Adrian, that's mostly going to be the same. Natalie is actually one of my favorite characters in Miraculous. She's a badass and a girl boss and one of the only sensible adult characters in the show. Like, yeah, in any other kids show, Natalie would probably be the least interesting in the cast, but in a show like Miraculous, she's pretty alright. I do think she has some room for improvement though, particularly in the fashion department, so we're going to go over how I would elevate her design and how she fits into my ongoing storyline, which if you guys aren't aware or if you've forgotten what's been happening, I have a playlist for all the videos that you can rewatch and I'll be recapping it a little bit in this video as well. I also want to add that I will be redesigning the other support characters that aren't as integral to the plot as uh, Marinette, Adrian, and all the villains, like for example Kagami and Luca, but I might not necessarily involve them as much in the plot, at least not the main plot. Maybe they're part of an ongoing B or C plot, but that's probably it. My next Miraculous redesign will be on Master Fu, so be sure to stick around for that. But before we get into the video, I want to give a shout out to Squarespace. You guys know I love Squarespace. They're the best all-in-one platform for building a website, a business, or getting your own web domain. 
If you're someone hoping to build an online presence as an artist, influencer, or brand owner, it's very important that you have somewhere to compile your information and portfolio to showcase to potential buyers or sponsors. I used my Squarespace website to showcase my original Miraculous Ladybug spin-off alternate world, alternate universe. It's called Wild Word. And if you want to learn more about that, I also have a playlist, but you can also visit wildword.squarespace.com. If you're interested in making your own website, Squarespace can give you a free trial to do that. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Kalimara or use code Kalimara to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Now that I've given you the general overview of Natalie as a character, let me go more in depth with her design. I think her current design, as rudimentary as it is, actually informs us of her personality quite effectively. Unlike most characters in Miraculous with dull designs, Natalie is actually meant to be quite a dull character. Kind of like Pinkie Pie's sister Maud from My Little Pony. It's just one of the rare occasions where their design incompetence works in their favor. From the high turtleneck and tidy hair, we know that she's a serious, uptight character who is a perfectionist. She's very precise, organized, and put together. An adult you would actually trust to make good decisions, if you will. So technically, I could leave the civilian design as is and it would be fine because I think her personality works well as it is and I don't see any pressing issues that would warrant a change. It makes sense why Gabriel never notices Natalie as a love interest because she's so dull and flat and restrained. She never shows her true emotions, especially in the beginning of the show. The only thing I'd change really is maybe she shows more of her warm, caring, and kind side to Adrian, acting more like a surrogate mother than she does in the show. Maybe one of the reasons why Adrian has been doing pretty well so far is because Natalie is there to kind of fill that void that his mother left behind. It opens up the possibility of Gabriel noticing that one day seeing how well she gets along with Adrian and how she makes him happy and realizes that, oh, while I was being stupid and trying to attain these unrealistic goals, Natalie was here the entire time holding down the fort for me. You know, I think that would be a pretty good character development on Gabriel's side. Maybe Natalie is even the answer to the ending of Miraculous Ladybug. Maybe Natalie is the person that actually makes Gabriel let go of his fixation on his wife. I think that could be a fun storyline to explore. But as with all the fashion choices in Miraculous, Natalie's design could definitely be more interesting and eye-catching to better reflect how Natalie seems like a drab and boring character on the outside, but the more you get to know her, the more facets there are to her character. And I think clothing is one of the best ways you can imply that about a character, if you so choose. My goal with Natalie is to make her look like the girl boss she is. I want her to look interesting and eye-catching in a way that is polished but still reserved enough in a way where you could feasibly believe she would kind of blend into the background a little bit. Since she is working for a fashion designer, I think it's only fair that she show a bit more flair and style. I don't really know what happened, but something in my head just told me to give Natalie long fashion model legs because I feel like at the very least, you'd have to look the part to get any kind of job for a Parisian fashion designer. And I know I get criticism for putting female characters who are physically active in heels, but I'm still gonna do it anyway because I think it looks good, it suits the look I'm going for, and Natalie canonically wears heels in both her civilian and hero form. And you know what? I think people need to stop looking down on female characters who do fight in heels and underestimating their abilities or their intelligence because of their choice of footwear. 
If anything, they should receive more praise because that's really freaking hard to do. Fighting and wearing heels as two separate things are challenging enough and take lots of practice to get used to and be good at. So both at the same time, look, I'm sorry if you're not that bitch, but you don't need to go and hate on her for being that bitch. Have we as a society learned nothing from Legally Blonde? What, just because she's a serious Harvard lawyer means she has to give up her identity and what she enjoys to conform to the social norm of that subculture? No, if she can make it work, then who are you to say what she can and can't do? Plus, I just disagree that a woman being able to fight in heels is the most unrealistic thing in a world where children can literally jump over buildings, be thrown into buildings without a single scratch, and reverse all damage no matter how extensive or severe using a catchphrase. It's not even that unrealistic in real life because a dance group on America's Got Talent or one of those Got Talent shows literally performed an extremely acrobatic and difficult dance routine in stiletto heels and they nailed it. Plus, I feel like heels would be a tactical advantage in a fight because you'd also be dealing piercing damage. Am I salty because that's what people are saying about my original magical girl, Fel Noir? Yes, absolutely. And I feel like I need to clarify that her heels literally don't affect her mobility, balance, agility, or stealth because it's magic. And that's how she chooses to appear because it makes her feel confident, strong, and beautiful. If you guys want to draw your magical girls with sneakers or boots, then do that. I fully support it and there's no one stopping you. Just don't put others down for not doing that. It's all in good fun and what's the point of having a fantasy world where literally anything can happen, at least within its established set of rules, if you can't even fight crime and look the way you want while doing it. And I get that it has a lot to do with standing up or rebelling against the current unrealistic beauty standards for women, but also maybe some women like heels. You know, I definitely like how I look in heels and I think that should be okay too. But anyway, getting back on topic, I decided to keep Natalie's downturned eyes because I think they hint at the fact Although she's seemingly a cold, stoic character on the outside, she's actually a gentle soul on the inside, which we've seen canonically in the show, especially when it comes to Adrian. Probably one of the biggest things I wanted to fix, though, was her hair. Miraculous animators just absolutely hate hair volume, and Natalie's hair is no different. Although overall, I think the style actually suits her character because it looks like she really brushed down her hair, you know? It almost looks like she's wearing a wig, which isn't so appealing. So while I decided to keep her tidy bun, I just tried to make it look more natural and make it look less like she just doused every strand of hair in hairspray or really pulled her hair back and is probably pulling hair out of her own follicles doing so. For a bit of flair, I also decided to add a tasteful, loose strand of hair to make her look softer and more elegant. On the other hand, while I do love the fact that Natalie wears a suit because I think suits are one of the most attractive things a woman could wear, her current suit just isn't very appealing. The fashion in Miraculous is extremely dated and it's especially prominent in Natalie. So although I definitely wanted to carry her suit concept over in my redesign and preserve that clean, put together look, Natalie's wardrobe is in desperate need of an update. As usual, I looked to Pinterest for some inspiration and this suit in particular really called out to me. That waistcoat? Just yes. I think it also helps create more segments that add complexity to her design and it helps define her proportions better. Initially, I thought I was definitely going to keep her turtleneck, but the colored dress shirt and tie combo just really appealed to me for this design, and I think it embodies the look I was trying to achieve with Natalie the best. This combo also reminds me a lot of Makima from Chainsaw Man, so obviously it is the correct answer. But I didn't just want to leave her with a waistcoat. 
I wanted to give her an outer coat as well for a full three-piece ensemble. Right away, I knew she should wear an over-the-shoulder style coat because I think it just looks really badass and it gives her more of an interesting silhouette. After I'd finalized her design, I wondered if she should still have her glasses and while I think there is charm in it being worn all the time, I decided that in my version, there are her reading glasses that she'd wear when she's going through paperwork. Because a person sitting at a desk in a suit going through paperwork with reading glasses is just one of the most attractive things to me. Plus, I'm really bad at drawing glasses and I really don't like doing it. <laughs> um, but when filling in her base colors, of course I kept her red ombre and to make her suit a bit less monochrome, I decided to give her a red dress shirt to match her ombre. For Mayura, I actually think she has one of the most fitting costumes for someone in the fashion industry. I definitely see what they were trying to go for and this design is definitely giving crazy rich socialite. But in my opinion, they kind of half-assed it. As usual. But even then, it's still way better than Gabriel's hawk moth suit. He's supposed to be the famous designer here, but Natalie is the one serving looks. I'm sorry, but she is coming for his job. So for my redesign, I'm fully committing to the feather robe idea. I went and found the most flamboyant style of robe I could to really lean into the peacock concept, which by design are some of the most extravagant creatures in nature. I also love the dichotomy of the minimalism of her civilian wear against the flamboyant over-the-top design of her hero form. The idea is to make her look like a wealthy, upper-class socialite from the early to mid-1900s who spends her days lamenting in her mansion because she has mysteriously lost her husband. Plus, I think it's really cool how Mayura doesn't actually wear a mask to hide her identity, but she actually gets the same coloration and markings as her Kwame. Kind of like my concept for my original magical girl story. <laughs> Shameless plug. <coughs> In Miraculous though, it's probably because the Peacock Miraculous is broken. Therefore, it is also the only Miraculous in the show that has a valid excuse to look weird. Keeping that in mind, I decided to keep those details in my redesign because I think it really makes her stand out. Initially, I wanted to carry over the hair bun from her civilian design into her transformed appearance, but I thought it would be a fun change to lean into the lack of hair volume that Miraculous really struggles with and make it look purposefully slicked back. I added feather trimmings to the robe to maintain that feather motif and added peacock crown feathers to replace her original veil. And to add to the vintage look I've created, I decided to fashion it into a headband to make it reminiscent of flapper fashion from the 1920s. Aside from the fashion overhaul, I pretty much kept the color palette the same, just with a bit more teals and azures to really evoke the appearance of a peacock. I'm actually quite surprised they didn't use those colors for Dusu in the first place. I think the green really adds a bit more intrigue and breaks up the monotony of Mayura's original suit. Let me know what you think! Now that we have the designs down, we can finally get on with the story and how Natalie fits into it. Previously on Kalimara's Miraculous After Cat Noir has left Ladybug's side and Felix has stolen all her Miraculous, Alia posts the information she managed to find with Queen Bee's help, implicating the entire anti-Ladybug movement as being part of Hawk Moth's reign of terror and launching an official police investigation on the organization, effectively revealing to the public just how far-reaching Hawk Moth's influence really was. Moved by Alia's loyalty, Ladybug comes to visit her and thank her personally, having nowhere else to go. She reveals her identity to Alia, and the two grow even closer as friends. So this is my hypothetical season 5, and the beginning half of the season would mostly center on Alia and Marinette doing their investigation, picking up on clues to try and piece together Hawk Moth's identity and his whereabouts. But then, in the middle of the season, 
they receive an anonymous email telling them that they know where Hawk Moth is and how they can stop him. The email includes an address for where they can meet to discuss further, and having nothing to lose, the two rush to meet their anonymous informant. And out from the shadows comes none other than Lila Rossi. And now we continue. Confusion crosses the faces of Marinette and Alia. What was Lila doing here? Was she really their informant? But how could she know anything about Hawk Moth? Surely this has to be some sort of mistake, or a ruse, or a lie. But as they exchanged passcodes, the skepticism slowly melts away, but their guard remained high. After all, this was Lila, the most notorious liar in their school. Alia's frown deepens. Of course it would be Lila of all people. This was exactly the kind of thing she would pull for attention. But before any of her thoughts could leave her mouth, Lila glances at Marinette suspiciously. What's she doing here? She's an admin of the lady blog. She's with me, Alia responds quickly, grabbing Marinette's clammy hand as if she was going to be taken away by some unseen force, or perhaps to prevent her escape from the confronting situation. Despite being a superhero, she never was the best at handling conflict, at least not once she couldn't fight. Besides, Alia continued, we're the ones who should be asking questions here. Lila's gaze pierced into Marinette's very soul. If looks could kill, she was certain that she would have dropped right then and there. But eventually, her gaze relents, and she gestures for them to follow her somewhere more secluded. Alia holds her tongue, for now. As they huddle into a narrow alleyway, a million questions had piled up in Alia's brain so much so that she could barely decide which one to ask first. But Lila beat her to the punch. Hawk Moth is hiding out at the Agrest mansion. Gabriel Agrest is involved in this. Deeply involved. Lila whispers in a hushed tone. Those million questions Alia had instantly evaporated into thin air. What? W- w- wait just a minute, Marinette stammered. You're saying the most famous fashion designer in Paris, Adrian's father, is involved with Hawk Moth? Alia snapped herself out of her stupor, reminding herself that she was Rena Rouge at that moment, anonymous investigator and runner of the Lady Blog, and she had a job to do. Where did you get that information? What evidence do you have? She steps forward, almost threateningly. If you're lying to me, we're out of here. But Lila seemed unfazed. Instead, a smug smirk pulls at her lips. I know, because I work for Hawk Moth. Marinette looked ready to explode at the implication that one of Paris's beloved designers, her hero, was the source of all of the chaos and suffering happening in the city. But Alia simply rolled her eyes, flapping her hands at Lila. All talk and no evidence. As usual, Lila. I'm not risking my life for tabloid gossip. At this, Lila lets out an exasperated sigh. Fine. And out of her pocket, she fishes out an object that had become the bane of Ladybug's existence. A fox marble. You. Without another word, the marble began to emit a blinding glow, forcing Marinette and Alia to look away. The light clung to Lila's body morphing into the shape of ears and nine luxurious tails, and once it finally receded, standing before them was Volpina. Alia and Marinette's eyes were wide as saucers, their mouths hanging open. All that time, the notorious fox villain had been right under their noses. However, Alia's shock only lasted a few moments before her inquisitive mind began turning yet again. But. Why are you helping us? Lila, Volpina now, hesitated this time, her fur bristling. She looked to the both of them in annoyance and hissed. Do you want my help or not? And without any other choice, Alia and Marinette agree. Good. Lila hesitates then. Because if you want to get to Hawk Moth, 
then there's one person you need to get rid of. Mayura. And with Lila's help, they managed to gain access to the anti-ladybug movement's secret circle. Specifically, the time and location of their next meeting. They wiretapped the location beforehand and set up hidden cameras. And once the meeting commences, they put their plan into action. And who are the members of this secret circle? Vulpina herself, Mad Dog, and a miraculous user they had never seen before, but one that Tiki immediately recognizes, the Peacock Miraculous. The right hand of Hawk Moth, handler of Mad Dog and Vulpina, and ringleader of the anti-ladybug movement through which Hawk Moth exerts his will. She was the one overseeing all of his operations, coordinated each attack, and placed all of their forces. In my version of Miraculous, the Peacock Miraculous' power isn't to create senti monsters, because I just think its purpose overlaps too much with the Butterfly Miraculous and gives the show too much of the same thing. So instead, it has the ability to see everything and everywhere she chooses at once. However, to use this power when trying to spy into a location, she must know where it is located and what the building looks like. And when attempting to spy on a person, she must know their appearance. That way, Mayura can't use this power if she wants to survey a certain building if she doesn't know where it is, and she can't watch someone who she has never seen before. This power was inspired by the eye patterns on Peacock's tails, and how its purpose, aside from attracting a mate, is to make it look big and intimidating to predators. I think it's the perfect complement to the butterfly's ability to give powers and create minions, because Mayura can now keep track of all of their movements, including the heroes. It's also how Hawk Moth managed to stay hidden and out of harm's way, because Mayura has always warned him ahead of time, and the reason why she hasn't just tried to watch the heroes until they transform is, I imagine when they change forms, Mayura can no longer see them because she doesn't know what their civilian form looks like and can no longer spy on them. But otherwise, she's the perfect strategist and support, and the mastermind behind many of the anti-ladybug movement schemes. Unfortunately, due to her incredible sight, she notices the hidden cameras and wiretaps and immediately deduces that they've been compromised. She gives one of the hidden cameras to Mad Dog, who tracks the scent to the culprit who set them up, leading him right to Alia. Mayura sends Vulpina with him for backup and retreats, but little does she know, it was all part of the plan. While Vulpina and Mad Dog were distracted, a red flash bolts after Mayura. Ladybug's signature yo-yo launches forward, encircling itself around her and ensnaring her mid-jump. She's yanked down forcefully, slamming into a rooftop. Overhead, Ladybug leaps into view, rushing towards her with an attack. Well, well, Mayura hums. I wondered where you went, little bug. Meanwhile, Volpina and Mad Dog track down Alia in no time, and once they have her in their sights, they give chase. Alia leads them into an abandoned building. Once inside, Volpina turns on Mad Dog, attacking him and attempting to snatch his miraculous from him. But Mad Dog is bigger, and he's angry. He starts to overpower Volpina, but just as it seemed her fate was sealed, the whistle of a flute cuts through the air and a tiger comes barreling towards him, surprising him badly enough to allow Vulpina to get away. He throws his fetch ball to teleport the tiger away, but the ball passes through it harmlessly. Instead, the tiger dissipates into golden dust. An illusion? He growled, raising his gaze, and for a second, he wondered if he was seeing double, because before him now stood two foxes, Vulpina and a flute-wielding hero, Rina Rouge. And that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching all the way here, I really appreciate it. Stay tuned for the next video, and if you guys like the story so far, let me know in the comments below. 
I want to thank my lovely pond dwellers for supporting me. If you also want to get early access to my redesigns and videos, receive monthly wallpapers of my art, and get featured in my videos, then do consider joining my Patreon. Thank you so much for the amazing fan art you guys made for Wild Word. It really makes me happy to see them and if you want to have your fan art featured, then send it my way on Twitter. That's the best place to reach me. If you want to see more from me, then please follow me on all my social media. If you want to chat with me, join my Discord server. And if you want to see more of my stories, check out my comic and my Wild Word series because that will make me really happy. All the links are in my description and I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye!